Hey church, would you help me say a big hello to our Bell Chase campus right now? Come on, put your hands together. We're so glad to be worshiping with you. Today is going to be an incredible day as we are kicking off a brand new series. Before we talk about that too much, I just got to give a shout out to Revival Nights. Anybody experience the presence of God in a great time? Every year during this time, we kind of, we stop and either do a prayer week, and this is our first time to, to really focus our attention on revival nights, to kind of push us outside of our comfort zones. If you miss those, I want to encourage you to make sure that you make it to our Catalyst Night that's coming up in just a few weeks. I'll tell you more about that later, but our Catalyst Nights are all about, the, you know, just pushing us deeper and further in to God's presence. Just want to give a shout out to our worship team, the amazing talent talented group that we have. Can we honor them for leading us? Hey, y'all, it's a big deal to do it Sunday to Sunday and to be prepared to throw three more nights in the middle of the week and for them to do all of that. So proud of our team. Amen, everybody. It's something we're doing as we're kicking off these two months where we're focusing on turning 10. I think 10's a big deal. And I believe that God has anointed us in this season. Anointing means authority, that God has given us authority to do some great things. And I'm excited to lean into that. I'm excited to turn 10. I feel like I, I need to start, you know, maybe dressing nicer. I don't know, but maybe I'm just kidding. Need to uh, start acting a little bit more mature. I'm not sure that's gonna happen either. But there is something about owning and building and being the church together. Today I'm kicking off a series that we've simply titled Made For This. And for the month of August, I'm going to be reminding you that, that we are not an accident, and this is not an accident. That we were made for such a time as this, that God has given us everything we need to see revival in this city go beyond us. And I think there's something that he's building in us that we're going to carry into the next decade, amen? So this month, made for this, I'll tell you more about September. Our actual birthday is the end of September, so if you're looking at making sure you don't miss a Sunday, you don't want to miss the last Sunday of September, okay? We're going to jump right into the Word of God, Isaiah 61. It's going to be on every screen. I'd love for you to turn there with me or to look there with me. It's the very first message Jesus ever preached. So he's 30 years old. He's just, just finished his training under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He's come out of the wilderness. It's been a rough time. But he knows he's prepared. Now he's going public. Now he's going to reveal himself to the world. And he walks into a church service. I like to imagine he came into One Hope Church today. How about y'all, right? I like, to walk, I like to imagine he walked in and he grabbed the Bible from the guy in the front. And he just turned to Isaiah 61. And here's what he said. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. To proclaim, come on, read it with me, the favorable year of the Lord. And jump to verse 7. He says, instead of your shame, you will have a, say it with me, you will have a double portion. And instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land. And read it with me, come on. And everlasting joy will be theirs. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, today as we lean into studying your word, God, I pray that our hearts really would be prepared for what you want to do in us and through us. God, we're so expectant today of a powerful time. And Lord, we simply add this to our prayer today. Lord, we just ask if one of the saints' quarterbacks could be as good as Drew Brees, we pray. In Jesus' name, we all said amen together. Amen and amen. I don't know if your religion allows you to pray for the saints, but I'm praying for them, y'all. I'm praying for them because I looked at our roster, and we need some help. How about that? We need some help. That's not anything to do with today's message. I want to help you to realize that God has a purpose and a meaning for your life, and he's so focused on that purpose and meaning that he wants to give you a double portion so that you can do what he wants you to do. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but uh, recently hosting lots of friends here this week for Revival Nights, uh, I've spent a few lunches and a few dinners eating out, and 
There's nothing like walking into a restaurant you've never been to before, and you're just kind of, what's good, what's amazing? Are, are y'all like me? I'm kind of like a hawk. I'm walking through. I'm trying to spot this table. I'm trying to be nice to people, but I'm really wanting to see what looks good on their table so that I can ask, is that steak or is that a pork chop? Is that Because uh, I'm a meat eater. Amen, everybody, right? I'm kind of eyeing it up. And, and recently, I'm not really a Yelp guy, but my wife and, and friends, they, they love to pull up pictures of food. Come on. And we got the menu and we got pictures and we're scrolling. And then we're ordering based upon what we saw walking in and the pictures that we saw on the Google, everybody. And then you're so excited, you're kind of salivating. Anybody like, you you saw that pork chop? Oh, Jesus, help us, right? And you know it's going to be a good day. And when you saw it coming in, it looked like a double portion. But when it got to your table, it's like you got the last chop they had in New Orleans. It's ever happened to you? It's ever happened to you that your expectations were high and then you rolled in and it was like, no, 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 this is, this is not even appropriate for what you're charging me. Amber and I went to a restaurant for our anniversary, a 20th anniversary last year, and it was a big deal. We kind of set aside this time. We're going in, and on the way in, a gentleman was like, he was sopping his plate. He was like, you, you know, like when you're walking in, a guy is wiping the juice out of the plate. It's going to be good. I was, I was, yeah, we are about to enjoy the favor of God. We ordered, and I, I should have been worried when the appetizer came out with like two pieces of bacon and then the soup, it was supposed to be a multi-course meal. The soup was two spoonfuls. I started worrying, y'all. I was like, we ate an entire four-course meal and then went and got a burger and beignets afterwards. (laughs) Terrible. (laughs) She did not say amen or oh my my. She said, that's terrible. We've all had moments in our lives where we walked in, we were expecting one thing, but got another. We had our eyes set on something bigger, but it just didn't turn out the way, it didn't turn out the way that we expected it to. And I think for some of us, this is our lives right now. So for some of us, we like, like, I was watching the videos of what adult life looked like, and I did not know that this was adulting. We've all got this like experience of like, I was hoping that when I got in my 40s, I wouldn't have this fear. I was hoping when I got in my 50s, the money would be taken care of. I was hoping when I turned 30 that I, that I would be, and you just fill in the blank. We've got all these expectations of what the portion of life is going to look like, but quite often the portion <laughs> looks like the small chop that never belonged there. Amen, everybody? I love that Jesus' first message to us was, I I need you to know the Spirit of God is on me. And he sent me to break some things out of your life because I want you to have the double portion of meaning, purpose, fulfillment. I want you to have something that you don't have now. I I just, there's this, I've said it to you the last few weeks, I've come out of my break with this hunger, uh, this fire, this desire that I refuse to get under the table or be on the table. Come on, we're in New Orleans. I want a seat at the table of God and I want the meal that he promised. I believe that he is still God. He is still favoring us. And I believe that 2024 is still a favorable year under God's blessing. I'm just... Wondering, is anybody in here tired of the single portions? Anybody in here ready for the double portions? Anybody in this room excited about what God can do? I want to help you to move from the mundane because God has a double portion for you. And this terminology, you understand it today, but in Jewish culture, they understood it very, very clearly because the eldest son, when the father was passing away, would give the eldest child a double portion so that he could carry on leading the family. So if there were four children, there would be five portions, and the eldest would get two. He would get double everyone else so that he could lead the family well. I think that's amazing. When Jesus walked up and says, I want all of you to be treated like the firstborn. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. He's the first of the family, and he says, I want you to have what I have. 
I like this guy. How about y'all, right? I like his mindset. But he says there's some things that have to come off because, listen, it's hard to live a double portion life when you're still a prisoner who needs freedom or a captive who needs liberty. It's hard to walk in those things that God wanted for you when you're still living with less than and focused that this is, this is what it's going to be. So when you read Isaiah 61, it sounds like he's saying the same thing twice. Prisoners and captives, isn't that the same? It's not. Prisoners have outward physical chains and bars in their life. They're in prison. Captives have no physical chains and no bars, but are forced to live as though they're in prison. I think there's a whole generation of Christians who have a form of Christianity, but they're so captivated by the world that they're living according to the world's ideals, and they don't have anything that God... So they're walking around as if they're still in the same chains that God set us free from. Think about this for just a moment. The recidivism rate, that's people going back to prison after getting out of prison, is very, very high. The longer you were in prison the first time, the shorter you might be able to, to change. But a lot of people, the reason they go back in quickly, you know why? Is because when they get out, they still act like prisoners. They still act like that's where they belong. Today, I just need you to know that you're, you're a foreigner in this world, the Bible says. You've been adopted as a child of God. You don't have to live with single portions anymore. Every year when we were younger, uh, especially in my teenage years, my parents loved to take us to, to the, the, the Gulf Coast, uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama. Anybody been to Gulf Shores, Alabama? They go to the beach, go to the beach. It's kind of close. It's just when the water starts looking nice, right? Just a little bit, right? The Mississippi mud is, you got to go there. But there was this place there called Lambert's. Every year we, we would go to the beach, and every once in a while, we would end up in Lambert's. If you've ever seen Lambert's, there's a giant sign that says, Lambert's, home of the throwed rolls. It's poor English. But they throw hot bread at you in the meal. Do you ever, I mean, you ever been somewhere where you like, you order and, and it shows up? It's a lot. It's southern cooking. It's a lot. And then there's a young man walking around with a tray bigger than him, holding it with a glove on, and people are holding up a hand, and brother is throwing hot bread <laughs> across. First time I went, I was just like, you know, catcher's mitt trying to grab then i realized that if i went one two he would throw one two anybody here up for pastor josh throwing you a one two today right <laughs> come on let's i know y'all can't handle my humor i pray for the saints some of y'all act like i was a sinner it's okay i'm just trying to do my best because some of y'all gonna miss church for them Moving right along. <laughs> Colossians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, see to it. Come on, say those four words with me. Three words. See to it. If I could count, it would be better. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. See to it that nobody gets in between your being captivated with Christ. And he lists four things that are captivating us. I want you to take some notes with me, write it down. I'm going to make sense of it for you today. The first thing he says is what's captivating us is philosophy. Philosophies of this world, good ideas that aren't godly. You ever heard any good ideas that aren't godly around here? Not in this place. I'm, we're always talking about the word of God. But people have all sorts of philosophies today. We got, we got political philosophies. We got parenting philosophies. We got marriage philosophies. But can I just tell you, your political affiliation has nothing to do with God. How about parenting philosophies? I've discovered that as I've gotten older that there are really two kinds of parenting philosophies. There's the timeout parents, one, two, and three. And then there's the parents I had, which were whoopings. 
There was no counting. You do what I say when I say it, or you're going to bring you to the brink of death and show you how much obedience will save your life. It wasn't that bad. I'm just kidding. My parents are in the front row. They, I, I was never abused. I was never, ever abused. But I was whooped a couple of times, and I deserved all of them. Amen? I deserved all. Don't believe in abuse. Don't believe that. Don't even go down that trail. But I think there's a philosophy there that's been lacking. I said it earlier. I'll say it again. Justin Timberlake said he wanted to bring sexy back. I want to bring whoopings back, everybody. <laughs> I think there's some people in our city, our nation, our world just need a good old-fashioned mom or dad come in and say, we not doing that around here. Hey, y'all are doing better than the first service. I can tell you that right now. I scared them so bad. I'm funnier this one. I can tell you that. We've got philosophies all around us, but they're not godly. And you've got to be careful because you'll be captivated by a philosophy. Seems nice. It's a oh, good idea. Oh, but it's not what God said. And then you're living as though you're captivated by the world rather than God. Here, write down the second one. The second one he says that captivates us is empty deception. Empty deception is twisted truths that but never fulfill. So again, they sound, wow, that's amazing, but they're empty because they never actually deliver. Think about uh, the snake in the garden. Eat this fruit and you'll be like God. That's, a, that's an empty deceit. That's a lie. But it's, a, it's masked in a little bit of a half-truth because when they ate the fruit, now they would have the knowledge of good and evil, which God did have the knowledge of good and evil. God understood what was going to happen, so the snake twisted it up, and then they did that thing. How about this one? I'm just going to meddle just for a second, just, just like five, 30 seconds. You ready? How about sex before marriage? It's an empty deception. You've got to try it before you buy it, or you don't buy it at all. Can I just tell you, you want to have the best marriage of your life? Start with someone brand new. The best kisser you ever met is somebody that's never kissed anybody else. Come on, everybody. The best you ever had is two people who walk in with their innocence and their love and their passion. This is what God intended. I know it got quiet like a Methodist church right there. I understand. Because we're fearful because we've made mistakes. But what would it be like if you just stopped making the mistakes and waited? I waited four years. I, I stopped living the world's way four years. I lived a godly life, pursued God. I let go of the worldly empty deception and waited for a woman of God. It was worth it, by the way. By the way, there are still many women out there who want to do the right thing. And by the way, there's a lot of them in this church. Just trying to help some of the brothers and sisters out. <laughs> listen, listen. The third thing that's captivated us is tradition. This one is another that just, it's, you know, like, but tradition is following someone other or something other than Christ. Tradition. We, we've always done it this way. Church has always been this way. Well, if you grew up in a 99.9% .9 white or black church, that's a tradition that I don't believe is biblical or godly. Preaching better than y'all are amen and right now. Come on. Listen, listen, listen. There's these extremes in our culture that want to push us away and divide us. But when you, when you pick a side, you divide. We've got to pick each other. We've got to choose each other. And so if the worship was a lot for you today because it's a little bit, a little bit more passionate than what you used to, stretch a little bit, right? And if you come out of crazy town, stretch a little bit the other way. We can be passionate without being weird. Can I get a better Amen. We can be honest about our faith without looking like what in the world happened in there. But there is a tradition that's been trying to drive us. And traditions by themselves maybe aren't bad. The Apostle Paul actually said, I love him, he's so funny. He said, he said forget the traditions you were taught. And in the next breath he says, keep the traditions I taught you. <laughs> so traditions aren't the problem. The problem is when your heart is no longer in the actions that you're taking. You're just doing it because we always did it because we got to go. Easter and Christmas is going to make it to church because I want to make sure I'm good with grandma. That's a tradition that's killing us. It's a tradition that's going to kill the next generation. What they need is to see a heart that is truly aligned with God. And then, yeah, you can build some traditions based upon your passion and your honesty and your authenticity. I think it's great. I think we need a revival of going back to church. 
But something that happens when you look around and you see people that look like you and people that don't look like you going after God together, this room is different. This room is different. And Wednesday night, revival night, Pastor Mandela and the worship team from Union were here. And he stretched me a couple times. Is that okay? Yeah. Pastor Stephen Chan looked at me and he said, you knew what you were getting <laughs> when you invited him here. Hey, sometimes you've got to open the door and see what God it wouldn't give you another portion. And sometimes we're so closed because we're afraid of what it might look like. You, you don't have to be strange, but you don't have to be strange. You don't have to, you don't have to, but if you don't open the door, you're never going to get the more that you're looking for. The fourth, he says, that has captivated us is elementary principles. These are immature thoughts and practices. Some of us are, we're still in elementary school in our faith. We're actually, some of us still in maybe junior high or high school in our, actually in, in our actual emotional intelligence because that's where we were harmed. We're holding on to these elementary moments because they were defining for us but these are immature thoughts and practices that aren't what God wanted for us. If the very first message Jesus preached says, God's Spirit is on me, and I got good news, you don't have to have that, you can have double. If that is the first message that he says, I need to come and I need to break some chains. I need to pull some things. I need to make sure that you are not captivated by this world. Because it's in the captivations that we lose the portion that God wants to give us. I believe that you were made for a double portion. Ephesians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul says, therefore it says, when he, Jesus, ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, read the next line, and he gave gifts to men. When he was ascending into heaven, he took a bunch of people who were living in captivity because the Jews, most of them were not in prison, but they were being ruled by the Romans. They were not free. They were captives. They were being, they, they had to ask for permission for worship. Sounds like when they were in Egypt, can we go make this sacrifice? No, no. They were captivated. And he said, I took that bunch of captives and I led you to be my captive. I brought you into a place of freedom, healing, respect. He's, uh, and then he didn't just say, I want you to be captivated by me. Because wouldn't it be cool just to hang out with God? Well, I mean, just imagine with me. There are some fun, like, as you go back in history, there are some writings of people who imagined, it's not truth, but they imagined what it had been like to hang out with Jesus when he really was 12. Could you imagine, like, getting to, like, hang out with God while he was developing? But that's not it. He didn't just say, I don't want you captivated by them. I don't want you to be captivated by me. The Bible says that he gave gifts. He not only said, I want to captivate you with my presence, my life, my joy, my hope, my grace, my, uh, but I want to also give you a gift to bring to the world. You know that gifts are, are for you and for the world. Gifts aren't just for us. So if your gift is making money, it's not just for you. If your gift is leadership, it's, it's for you and for others. You all hear this today? If your gift is miraculous healing, God wants to do it in you, but he wants to do it through you. And his, the double portion quite often is limited by your and my faith in God. The question is today, if God wants to give me more leadership and more influence and more blessing, he wants to, the question is how do I live for that? How do I let go? How, what do I have to do? Write it down with me. Number one, I want to just help you move through this quickly. Number one, you, you got to let go of the former captivations. You're going to have to identify the tradition that's holding you back, the philosophy you bought into, the elementary principle, whatever it is that's holding you back. You're going to have to write it down and say, no, no, God's word says that that is not right. 
You're going to have to let go of the former captivations. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.22 that in reference to your former men of life, what do you do? You lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. What things might be there? They're usually attached to the lusts. They usually, what things do you need to stop doing? They usually attach to the hungers that are driving you to say this or to do that. Can I just dare say it today? Every single one of us has at least one thing in our life that we just need to stop right now. I'm not going to list them. Aren't y'all glad? Aren't you glad? How about you have a conversation with the Holy Spirit? How about you pray and ask God to illuminate? And then when he says, hey, you need to stop dating over there. <laughs> You're fishing in the wrong pond. I'm meddling now. Y'all see that? <laughs> Listen, if you're going to fish in that kind of pond, that's what you're going to catch. Yeah. I'm a redfish guy. How about y'all? I don't want any catfish in my life. I want redfish. <laughs> There's all kind of jokes right there. Y'all can laugh about it later. Everybody say number two. Number two, start following God's principles. This is not deep stuff. But listen, when the Bible says, that's what we believe. When the Bible says, that's what we should strive to do. And I just think we're saying, well, mom always said do this. Well, mom said isn't actually in the Bible. It may be. Maybe you had a godly mother that's teaching you the Bible. I pray you did. But listen, you're going to have to find what the Bible actually says. And I think if you've been with us through Revival Nights and even today, what you're going to see even more prominently placed in our worship liturgy on Sundays is you're going to see the clear reading of the Word of God in the middle of worship. Why? Because more than you need to hear me say some stuff, you need to hear the Word of God. Come on, Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear right he goes on to say you should be confident trusting because you're going to live in the house of God I love this we need to set the word of God in a prominent place in our life Ephesians 4 22 says that you should be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self which in the in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness holiness and truth number one if you need to let go of the former captivations maybe you should look for a freedom small group this fall Number two, if you need to start following God's principles, maybe you need to jump in a growth track small group this fall and for 13 or 14 weeks learn how to let go of some things or learn how to grab onto some things. He said, I need you to take some stuff off. Everybody, hey everybody, I, there's some things you need to let go of, but we don't want a bunch of naked people running around here. Amen, everybody? You're going to have to put Jesus on afterward. <laughs> We in New Orleans were there naked, naked bike rides. I need to make some things clear. <laughs> Number three. We need to stay faithful with single portions. There isn't a single person in this room that doesn't have a single portion. You already have a portion. God is already providing for you. But if you want God to give you a double portion, then you've got to steward the single portion first. It is all throughout Scripture, all throughout Scripture, that if you aren't faithful with the little, why would God ever give you the much? And if you're going to live captivated by the world, why would God give you so much to spread that captivation? Why would God bless us with a double portion when we're still living in a way that's not honoring to him? That's why Ephesians 5.10 says, find out what pleases the Lord. You want to memorize a verse? Memorize that one. Come on. Six words. Come on, read it with me. Find out what pleases the Lord. You know what pleases the Lord? Stewarding the single portion well. Listen, if you're never going to step out in faith and tithe, then you should never ask God to do a miracle financial blessing for you. If you're never going to steward what you already have in the single portion, listen, I hate to say it. He says, if you don't trust me with the first and the best, then I am not going to rebuke the devourer off of your life. The devourer is the devil who eats up everything you have. So there are some godly principles you got to lean into. And the one that I have to mention often to you guys is money. Why? Because America worships money 
We think if I could just get some more money, I could be more godly. It's not true. If I could get some more money, then I could get all the things that God promised. It's not true. Money is not God's blessing. It's a piece of the pie. It's not the pie. I don't know if you've ever eaten money, but pie is better than money. Don't equate God's blessing to just a dollar bill or a bank account number. The blessing of God is found in the people of God. The blessing of God is found in the relationships around here. Listen, God has done so much for, for me, in me and through me than he ever did just in a bank account. But I can tell you from a guy who's cashed out, a guy who's gone all in three times, God has blessed me immensely. There's some times that we look at each other and we even feel like, okay, what are we supposed to, God's blessing us and we, do we deserve this? No, no, I don't think we do. We've just been faithful with a single portion. Hey, everybody. You've been given a portion of time. You've been given a portion of talent. You've been given a treasure. What are you doing with it? Hey, some of you need to join the church and join the team so you can tithe your time. You can just give an hour or two a week to making a difference because you'll sleep better when you do that. When I was growing up, I was a young minister. Her name was, well, I was young coming up into ministry. She was an older minister, Sister Peggy Richards. She was a prophetic voice in our church when I was a kid. And she used to talk about how she stewarded her life. She would literally wash the lawnmower after each time she cut the grass. She one time told a story how that once a year, she goes into the garage, and she had those little glass jars, and she would screw the top to an underneath of a shelf, and you'd screw the jar in with all your loose screws. Anybody hear about it? You know what I'm talking about? Once a year, she would take that down, she would pour all the screws out, and she would wash all the jars. I got a ways to go. How about y'all? I got a ways to go. And she would just say, you can't outgive God. If you steward what God is giving you in the little things, God will give you more. Hey, everybody, steward the single portions. I think we've done it around here. You know, this is the third property that we're stewarding for the kingdom of God and the resources. And I'm believing that probably by the beginning of the year, next year, someone else is going to give us another one. You know why? Because we've been faithful with a little. God wants his kingdom to expand. We need churches on every corner. Amen, everybody? We need them. Here's the last, and we close number four. Number four. We need to pursue a godly double portion. Remember who God is. He's God. Don't get distracted. We need to be captivated by Jesus. I don't just want a double portion for me. I want a double portion for you. I want it to overflow. Ephesians 3.20 says it this way. Let's read it together. It says, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Immeasurable means you can't measure what God has done in your life and how good it is. Anybody here have faith for immeasurably more? Anybody here believe that God still wants to do more? In your life? Listen, you were made for a double portion. The way to the double portion is letting go of those things. The way to the double portion is letting go of the world's philosophy. The way to it is pursuing God. And then when you're faithful, you can't outgive God. As we close today, would you bow with me? Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here in this room and you say, Pastor, I haven't even felt like I've received a single portion. Today, if you're under the sound of my voice and you don't know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and that he paid for your sins, past, present, and future, if you don't know that he is the Son of God and Savior of the world, but today you sense him drawing you, you're, you're building faith in him, today this is your moment. I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand or come to the front. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today, you say, Pastor, I'm just far from God. I need God. Would you whisper this prayer? Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name.